You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lemire. Is there a way to generate more energy without having to drink caffeine or some crappy gut bomb? Is willpower the only way to get rid of your worst habits? And why is it hurting you to fantasize about a future where you're going to be free from the problems you have now? The Tools Guys, Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels are back to discuss the ideas behind some of the tools they use to help some of the most powerful people in the entertainment industry. Welcome to The New Man. Today, we're talking with Barry Michaels and Phil Stutz. They're the authors of Coming Alive, Four Tools to Defeat Your Inner Enemy, Ignite Creative Expression, and Unleash Your Soul's Potential. They also wrote another great book called The Tools. You can hear us talk about that on a previous episode of The New Man. You can learn more about these guys by visiting thetoolsbook.com. Welcome back, Barry and Phil. Thanks so much. Uh, there's so much I want to ask you. Uh, my copy, I got a copy of this book. Um, it's t- it, now it's tattered with notes and dog-eared pages, and um, so I've got a bunch of questions about the book, and then just stuff that I've been working with you, Phil. And it just there's things in the background I'm, I've just been wanting to ask you. I've been wanting to learn about where this stuff comes from. So this interview though is for the guy who's not familiar with your work. He doesn't know that you guys are helping very famous or very powerful people, and he, frankly, he doesn't really give a shit because he's facing his own challenges. So. These are challenges that may stem from an inability to stick to a fitness program or stay away from porn or junk food or social media. Maybe he's feeling drained or exhausted and he can't understand why some folks just seem to have a ton of energy and are able to get stuff done. Or maybe he's dealing with uh, just a series of negative thoughts and doubts that are holding him back and keeping him from making bold moves in the world. Uh, The other scenario could be that he's just stuck in a place where he feels like things aren't fair and he's being punished for something. So these are just some of the areas that you guys tackle and explore in the book. But the first thing I want to get kind of a beat on with you, Barry, is help us understand this concept of life force. What is it? Why does it matter? The life force is really a fancy word for something that we already experience, all of us, spontaneously, all the time. I mean, I'll give you an example. I experienced it in the writing of the book. I, many, many times every week I would get stuck, frustrated. I couldn't come up with the right words or I had the right words, but it didn't really, it didn't really say it as passionately or as intensely as I wanted to. And then sometimes an hour or two later, or sometimes a couple of days later, I would just be listening to music or exercising and bang, the answer would come to me. That was my life force. It's a creative force inside of you that gives you energy. It gives you ideas. And ultimately, it gives you the reason you're alive. It gives you a sense of purpose. Other people may experience it when they're camping out under the stars and they just suddenly feel expanded or filled up inside, like you could do anything. I'll give you yet another example. I experienced it at the birth of both of my children, where I was just awed by the miracle of life. And I was inspired to be the best father I could ever be. And my heart just broke open with a kind of love I I had never experienced before. And it's important because we're into fulfilling people's, getting people to fulfill their potential. And the life force is the force with which you do that. It gives you a direction to go in and it gives you the energy to get past the obstacles you need to pursue that direction. I'm kind of getting from that, that this is this internal energy generator, this uh, power source, instead of looking outside of ourselves that this is the thing that's within us and this is the stuff that fuels us to go and and make bold moves in the world or just be able to experience the life that we ultimately want. Is that right? That's exactly right. And, you know, you brought up energy earlier, you know, which is a great example. If you go into any convenience store, what you're going to see more than anything else is energy drinks. So we get energy from caffeine, nicotine, substances in the outside world, you know, sometimes a beautiful woman will energize us. And, you know, that's fine as far as it goes. But, you know, usually what happens is it wears off and you need more. And Mm. at the end of the day, you need what you used to use for energy just to get up in the morning, you know? So there's, Mm -hmm. there's like a point of diminishing returns. Whereas the life force, if you can get that energy from inside of you, it sustains itself 
constantly. In fact, the more you use it, the more you have of it. Okay. Phil, recently we were on a call together and you brought up Part X, this concept of Part X. Give us a little explanation of what Part X is and how that relates to what we're talking about here with Life Force. Yeah, I'll tell you what happened to me. I was young for a shrink. I was maybe 28, 29, and I was pretty defiant. I had my own views about things. Anyway, I, when I was fairly young, I, I had a pretty good practice. I, I think the reason I did was because I was very enthusiastic, like very. Um, not that I knew what I was doing, but I, the enthusiasm was, I want to help these people. I mean, I probably even thought about curing them at that age. Um, so what what happened to me in, let's say, the first couple of years of practice, maybe the first two, three years, is I would get, I, people would ride on my enthusiasm. And I, looking back on it, what I was really suggesting to them is that more is possible. And that I think Barry will agree that's kind of how we think of the life force. Yeah. It's, a, it's a force of potential. And it's the beautiful part of it is it's a it's potential that can always be added to expanded upon. It's it's basically limitless. Now I, I couldn't have described it that way um, at the time, but um, I my life force was pretty high at that age, and um, I got some quick cures. Freud called that a flight into health, which I'm not sure exactly how he meant that, but it was like. Um, it was almost like you were afraid not to get better because the shrink was so demanding or so enthusiastic or what have you. So that would happen. And at first I was pretty euphoric. I thought, wow, I'm great guns at this. And then I had the, uh, the very disappointing experience of um, the, the person's um, symptoms uh, come back. And very often they come back in even worse shape than where they started and it was it was a real problem because if some you know you promise somebody i'm going to cure you or help you or whatever make your it's mostly make your symptoms go away anyway what would happen would be the symptoms would go away it was a grand grandiose experience for me and then the symptoms would return and when they re- when they returned, there was a secondary secondary penalty, so to speak. And the penalty was that they lost faith in therapy altogether. They, what happened was they lost faith that um, conquering their symptoms and freeing themselves was possible at all. Hmm. Now, one good thing about me is I, I didn't give up, so I, I kept trying and trying and trying. And at, the harder I tried, the, the more... Um, resistance, so to speak, um, you know, I was experiencing from them. What happened was I started to feel the resistance and the, the, the return of the symptoms as a very, very goal-directed, very specific thing. It was like there was an enemy, and the enemy didn't really care what the symptom was that it was creating in, in, inside the patients. All it cared about was that the symptoms would return and the patient would end up with a sense of this is impossible. And once, the, once they got the idea it was impossible to cure their symptoms, then that sense of impossibility spread to everything. So basically it became impossible to change, impossible to realize your potential, impossible to attain the thing that most people were sensing they would like to achieve a kind of life. I think Barry mentioned it before. Um, and the door was shut right in their face. And some of the patients were quite pissed off at me. They thought I had, you know, fooled them or I didn't know what I was doing, which was certainly partially true. Anyway, th- what I found was this um, resistant force was in every single person. It didn't matter what the specifics were the, the the point was it was going to resist all change and all expansion and make sure you did not reach your potential. So not knowing what it is, I just called it part X. We had to call it something. And why is it there? I mean, do, is is there a reason why it's there? If, if you is it just 
part of the, the, the cosmic joke of life that we've got something inside of us that wants to hold us back? Or have you found a reason that makes sense? No, it's there um, because something that you win in a battle is worth more than something that is just simply given to you. It's already part of you. So, you know, that's the, that's a really deeply philosophical question, Trip. What, what, what makes life meaningful and fulfilling is that we become most, the most ourselves that it's possible to become. And if you have to battle for yourself, if you have to fight for yourself and win the, the potential that is inside of you, the potential is actually worth more because you went through something in order to get it. So in some way we're calling, we're calling it an enemy, but really deeply underneath it can be an ally. Exactly. It, it has both functions. It just depends how you look at it. It's, I'll give you a specific example of that. In other words, I, I have never gone wrong doing whatever part X is telling me not to do. My whole life I've been afraid <laughs> of, of public speaking. And when I started to do it, on my own, I was absolutely terrified. I mean, I would wake up the morning of a seminar literally feeling like a condemned man going to the gallows. And I mean, literally like, oh my God, please, please, I don't want to do this. Mm. And yet I have found it to be one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my entire life. So what I began to feel was part X wouldn't be, wouldn't be working this hard to stop me from doing something if it didn't know even better than I do, that it will be really good for me to do it. And in that sort of way, part X is evil because it's trying to work against you, but it's also good because if you have a, if you're aware of it and you can take contrary action, it can actually light the way in a, you know, in a strange way. And just, just to say one more thing about that, that is actually implied in the word that we, that at least Christian mythology has for the devil, which is Lucifer. You know, Lucifer is the devil in Christian mythology, but the name is derived from two Latin words, which mean bringer of light. So mm. there's something in part X about how you relate to negative forces where they actually, you can turn them into something positive for yourself. I like that. And, and I guess there's this, uh, this other burning question that most of us, most of us think that we're going to get to some place where we can rid ourselves of part X, where we're going to be exonerated of having to deal with this is is there a point do you guys offer that program where you <laughs> your six-week program where you're exonerated for part x i'll put it this way trip i i've been working on part x ever since i met phil 30 over 30 years ago and my part x is still going strong so <laughs> i don't think i'm ever getting rid of it and in a weird way i i don't want to i mean of course you wish that you could but when you've won as many battles as I have against it, I have a different attitude now. It's like, fine, bring it on, because I know I can overcome it, and I know it's going to lead to something great that I never anticipated. Well, it seems to speak also to, the, to this expectation. I think part of our suffering is wondering why this is happening and when is it ever going to stop. But if we let go of it, it's like, well, this is just part of it. I, something about me relaxes around that. Okay, this is the game. This is the game. You got part X. If these are the rules, I can follow the rules. At least I've got the tools that, that enable me to win the game. Mm. Yeah, I'll tell you another way to think about it, which is to, in order to connect to, to a higher force, you need the infinite part of yourself. In other words, you have to find a part of yourself that's analogous to the life force or to, to some higher force. And in order to do that, you need to be... Uh, conscious of what you're doing. In other words, if, if people m met their potential without very much effort and they just kept growing and growing and growing, they wouldn't really be aware of what they had accomplished or what actually happened. See, the idea that part X doesn't go away, you know, won't go away ever, what, what that means is you have to find a commensurate or equal part of yourself and that part of yourself is the part that won't give up. Mm. So part X forces you to function without any end point, without any willingness to give up at all. And that in turn, by doing that, you found the um, immortal, endless, infinite part of yourself. And that's the secret.
I love that. It, 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 it helps me, you know, kind of move into the next question, because Barry, in the first book, you talked that you were skeptical, uh, especially when Phil would talk about these infinite forces or the things that we can't necessarily see or touch or measure. Um, and so the tools are essentially these collections of powerful visualizations. Why do these help us? Why are they working? Are, they, are we just tricking ourselves? What's your explanation? Yeah, Barry, what's this one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because I, you know, I, I have gone through so many changes over the last 30 years, most of them due to my just avid, almost fanatic use of, of the tools. When I started out, I was incredibly skeptical of Phil. In fact, I, I, I have no doubt I annoyed him endlessly with my questions and my doubts and my arguments and, and everything else. I remember, I remember, for example, I would just give you an example of this. I, he told me at one point, look, you think you're depleted at the end of the day and that you don't have any energy, but actually you have infinite energy inside of you. And I thought, Oh God, Phil has started watching Oprah, you know, <laughs> no fucking way. Do I, do, can I curse by the way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no way do I have infinite energy. Um, so, but I, I always kind of believed Phil and I always wanted to test out, you know, the things that he was telling me. So at that time, it was the beginning of my practice. I would see anybody who walked through the door. So as a result, I was seeing like 10, 12 people a day. And if you've ever seen 10, 12 people a day who are bitching and moaning, you know how exhausted yeah. you are at the end of the day. And my kids were really little and my wife was worn out. She was working and also taking care of the kids. So I, I would, I, I, my fantasy when I went home at the end of the day was I could just turn invisible and slip past them and go upstairs and go to bed. But instead, I would sit outside the house in my car thinking, all right, Phil says I have infinite energy. Let me test this out. And I didn't know a tool for it at that time. So what I decided to do was just act as if I had all of the energy and all of the enthusiasm and all of the love and intensity that I brought to my patients. I was going to bring it to my family. Mm. And sure enough, I would walk through the door and it was pure pretend. It was just me doing a like a Robert De Niro. I was doing my best acting job. I'd throw my kids up in the air and I'd you know, love my wife and embrace her and talking to her about the problems of the day and help her getting dinner, et cetera, et cetera. And damned if 10, 15 minutes into it, I suddenly would check back in with myself and realize, holy shit, I have a lot of energy now. Mm. I'm not depleted. It was like I kicked in to some unused portion of my unconscious that I wasn't aware of. And to get back to your question, I do think that that's what's happening is that when you use tools, they expand your access to a to parts of you that you're just not used to using, you know, whether you call it the unconscious or higher forces, I, I don't really care what you call it because I don't really care about theories anymore. I just know that it taps into the life force, which is a part of you that is partially buried inside of you and needs you, in essence, to evoke it, to bring it out. Yeah. And the stronger your relationship with that life force is, the less skeptical you are because it just works. Okay. Uh, well, this brings me to, I want to talk to you about the, the vortex, Phil. It's one of the tools in the book. And we see this. We see this where some guys are stuck in this low energy place and they're waiting. They're in this waiting place. They're like, well, once I once I'm I'm, I'm rested and once I feel energized, then I'm gonna I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna kick it in the ribs and I'm gonna engage this challenge in my life. But they just stay stuck. They never get to this place where they feel ready or they feel energized. So I'm curious, Phil, what do you how how can we understand how energy truly works from your from your understanding and why you created this tool? Um, what do we need to know so that we can have a different orientation towards creating or, or finding energy? Well, the first thing you have to know is waiting is bullshit. There is no such thing as waiting. So if you're waiting, you, you basically you're lost. And, and the way we've designed the therapy and, you know, to some extent the workshops is to train people to move forward. To, and basically, mostly it has to do with action, taking action steps and to feel that that's the state they need to be in all 
the time. So there's, there's basically um, nothing to wait for. Now, there's a thing called the, uh, the paradox of engagement. Here, here's the problem, whether they're, they're actually aware of it or not, which is they, they, they experience their own energy is so low that they can't engage. And it was like if I went out and socialized or if it's a kid, if I asked this girl on a date, whatever, um, I would be energized by the experience of it, but I don't have the energy to even take the first step. Okay, So that's called the paradox of engagement. You need to engage with the world to increase your energy, but you don't have enough energy to engage with the world to begin with. Mm-hmm. I think that most people, trip think think what, what you just expressed, which is I don't have enough energy and the world is going to deplete me even further so what I need to do is withdraw and hoard whatever little energy I have until my gas tank, you know, gets a little bit fuller and then I'll engage. And the withdrawal actually depletes you further. Okay. What I observed, um, and I still believe to this day, is most of the time people that are successful in life are those with the most energy. Not the smartest, mm. not the genius, not, it's mo- not 100%, but mostly it's the person with the most energy wins or accomplishes or feels satisfied. We, we assume that the person, if they can't do something, it's because they have some kind of psychoanalytic hang-up or edible pro whatever it is, which is you know not completely untrue, but I, I felt like and the, our whole philosophy in general, not just about this, is to get to the bottom line of things where we can actually have an impact on somebody, an impact that they can feel. If they don't feel the impact, um, it's just what I call loose talk, which I hate. But in order to feel the impact, you need more energy. If I want to create more energy in my life, then I need to engage. It's, it's this opposite of let me go hoard or pull away or isolate or stay on the couch. Um, I need to go, I need to muster up some energy and the tool helps us do that to then go make those first steps and get out of that paradox and get into action. And very often it's exactly what you said, Tripp. It's, it's the first step. It's usually a small step, you know, returning an email, jotting down notes for an elevator pitch, having one more interaction that you really don't feel like you have the energy to have. And, and the reason that's important is because a fulfilling life actually comes from taking the small steps you don't normally take. We think it's going to be a big dramatic thing, but it's not. Each additional step that you don't normally take when you take it isn't significant in and of itself. But if you're constantly expanding those small steps and taking more and more of them, you start to get the feeling of there's no limit to what I can do. I love that. Yes. Another way to say it is the biggest things enter through the smallest steps. So, you know, I just call that the world of small things. And actually, in terms of accomplishment, there's no difference between accomplishing a big thing and accomplishing a a little thing because when it gets down to actual functionality, it's all little. Intensity is not something usually that's discussed in in therapy. Mm -hmm. It seems more like an affect. Oh, isn't that guy, he's very enthusiastic or whatever, but we don't seem to attribute that to what's really happening underneath the hood or what's, what, what's showing up in their life. Yeah, we think of it as a quality, but not a skill that you can actually develop. I like yes, that. that's right. I want, let, let's shift over into this, this thing. There's so much talk about willpower, and there's so much talk about you know being able to stick to plans and having habits and all of this stuff. And People these days are wanting hacks. They want shortcuts. And I was, it was refreshing to read through uh, the chapter, Barry, where you talk about the Black Sun tool and how the key to overcoming our impulses is not about necessarily building up more willpower. Yeah, so I'll just throw this question. What's the basic premise behind having success over our impulses with food or sex or gambling or porn, et cetera? Right. Well, let me let me back up for a moment and just say that if if I were part X, in other words, if I were the devil inside of you, one of the simplest and most effective ways that I could hold you back is just to get you to give into one temptation after another. You're on a diet, I'm gonna get you to eat a donut. I'm gonna get you to spend hours updating your social media page when you should be you know, working on something that really means something to you. 
when, when my phone pings, you know, indicating I have a text or an email, I, it's like I'm like Pavlov's dog. It's so hard for me to resist looking at it. Mm. Um, what the tool in that chapter does is it gives you the ability to control those impulses which leads to a lot of rewards, one of which is more energy, because what you don't realize it is impulses dissipate your energy. It's like a leak in your gas tank because you're constantly like spending little bits of energy on things that just don't matter. Now, the, the reason the tool works so well is this. If you crave something that's outside of you, whether it's ice cream or a cigarette or even I just got to read the latest news, then think about it, you must be missing something inside, right? I mean, if, if, if there weren't some kind of emptiness inside of you, you wouldn't feel impelled to fill it, to fill it up. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have more of like a take it or leave it attitude. Now, sometimes you can control that impulse with sheer willpower. I want it, but I'm not going to let myself have it. But I want it, but I'm not going to let myself have it. And sometimes that works. The problem is it keeps the focus on the outside world as the ultimate source that's going to fill you up inside. So what would happen if you just gave up on the outside world ever filling you up? After all, it never has because you wouldn't be filled with impulses now if it had ever filled you up in the past. So if you could give up the outside world ever filling you up and instead just pay attention to the emptiness, something else might happen. Now, that takes some courage. I mean, nobody likes to stare inside of themselves at an abyss, but it leads to the magic. Because if you stare into that empty void long enough and calmly enough, what you find is that the nothingness turns into a somethingness. It's something that can actually fill you up inside. And what it is, is your life force. And what we find is that it gets you past that feeling of, oh, I have to conquer my impulses, but I'm always feeling deprived, which is a very negative feeling, even if you win you know, a few battles. And it actually brings a sense of serenity and a much greater sense of I have something to give. I don't always have to be getting from the outside world. This is such a huge shift because we've, we're just so conditioned that everything we need is outside of us that we've never actually taken a look, or most of us have never act, taken a, this look into what's the thing we're trying to run away from, which is this feeling of being deprived. But you're saying, turn into it, and there you're going to find this void, but really what's in that void is this life force that we've been talking about. And so, it's, again, it just feels like another cosmic joke. Oh, you spent your whole life running away from the thing you're trying to find. <laughs> it, was, it was within you the whole time. Exactly. Heraclitus yeah. says the boundaries of the soul are endless. There's this infinity inside of us, but we've run away from it so long that we're actually really scared and reluctant to even look at it. Yeah, just to go back to the energy thing, the, the, you know, we talked about finding a source of infinite energy. You, you can't find it um, outside in the outer world. The outer world is material, and by definition, it's, it's limited. So you can, the, the whole idea of finding or connecting to energy that's, that's infinite, or, you know, and what's most important is it's, it's an energy source that you can tap into when you, when you feel you have nothing um, that's you have to look in inside yourself for that, and the the inner forces don't have limitations on them. Mm. So, but the first uh, price you have to pay is looking into the void, and what seems like nothing is actually infinite, and what seems like something is what you're looking right outside you, outside yourself is actually very limited. If, if any of your listeners are involved in any sort of 12-step group, they might be more familiar with this because one of the tenets of 12-step of groups is we want to be of service to one another because what 12-step groups have discovered is a, a, a basically a variant on what we're talking about, which is the solution to our cravings, our solution to wanting to get more from the outside is to give more. By being of service to one another, members of 12-step groups are, in a sense, helping themselves 
because the more they give, the less they crave alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever it is they're addicted to. Mm. I love that. Well, Phil, you, you and I were on a call recently and, and you were teaching me the tower tool, which is in the book. And it's, it's, this is another one of those paradoxes. And you said this, you, you know, part of the phrase that's in this, in this tool is only the dead survive. And I just, yeah. I was, I, I told you, I was moved to tears when you, when we were going through that and I was just blown away by that. Um, can you, can you explain a little bit about what that means? Only the dead survive? Yeah, what it means is you're, you're, I mean, it's a tool to be used, let's say, when your feelings are very badly hurt by somebody, or you have a big project and it fails, or there's a rejection, or, you know, however you want to look at it. But all of these things, for at least for the ego, are deaths. Now, people obviously don't like that. Um, they're, they're afraid of death. And as a result, the, the, when they get injured enough times, or they, they get rejected enough times, they give up altogether. But what, they've actually misapprehended um, what death is. Basically, what, it's, what the um, saying means is you can't be reborn until you die. You can't be reborn until you die. And we're not talking about physical death, obviously, or, uh, you know, the ultimate definition, but... Um, all symbolic emotional experiences of death um, create an opportunity. And the opportunity they create is for you to be reborn. Now, and the, the two things that come out of that, one thing that comes out of it is you, you discover you, you can recover. So death, the meaning of death starts to change. And the second thing is not only do you realize you can recover from death, let's say, rejection just as an example but your life force actually increases your life force actually increases when you undergo one of these deaths and as a matter of fact if you don't um, undergo the death your life force can't increase so we're dealing with a cycle it's an ever-expanding cycle if we look at death as a finality especially this ego death my feelings or my self-image if that's ruined or that's changed or somehow injured, then I'm, I'm dead. Uh, I'm going to limit my power. I'm going to limit the abilities. And what you're saying is, no, we get to see that as a doorway to a rebirth where I get to be expand and have greater life force. Yeah, the idea is death. Is, you don't have to be afraid of death as long as you realize it's not the last final step. The kind of, when we say death, we mean something with finality, and that's what people are really afraid of, is the sense of finality. So we're saying death, of course it's scary, but it's not the last thing that's going to happen. There's something after death is probably the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. And that's something, is some kind of a rebirth, and the, the tool is designed for that. When you get hurt physically, you just let your body repair. So let's say you stub, stub your toe on a curb. You might sit down, you might walk it off, but pretty soon you're just on your way. But when your feelings get hurt, you deal with it very differently. You tend to relive it again and again. You know, how dare he say that to me? That was so unfair. I would never treat anyone like that. Essentially, you're going back to the curb and restubbing your toe over and over again. That's a victim state essentially. We don't like to think of ourselves as victims, but that's essentially you saying, this shouldn't have happened to me. Now, just step back from that statement for a moment. It doesn't matter whether it should or shouldn't have happened. It already did happen. Mm. Your opinion doesn't matter. You should be focused on getting over it, but part X makes it hard to let go. Because letting go means your opinion doesn't matter. There are forces in the universe that are stronger than you. Now that is an ego death. We know it intellectually that shit is going to happen, but when it comes to actually happening, our egos get inflamed and we start expressing opinions about stuff we can't even change. Mm. So the good news is, if you can let your ego die, you can move on. Little kids are a great example of this because their egos are not as strong as adult egos, so they actually process injuries really quickly. I mean, just watch a little kid who wants a toy and you say no. He wanted the toy passionately, 
He cries passionately, like his life is ending. And in record time, he's playing happily with something else. And we all have that ability inside of us, but for adults, giving in to that ego death requires a tool. And that's why the tool has only the dead survive in it, because you have to let your ego die in order to recover. Got it. Got it. I was in a meeting yesterday with my coaches group, uh, the, the people that I lead, and we were talking about how to deal with our negative thinking, the, when the thoughts and the beliefs that are in there that tear us down, you know, you're not this, it's the, the, the demoralizing stuff, the thing that diminishes us. And, and my guys were excited to have me teach them the, the mother tool, and I hope I did a good job. I had, I had, I had my notes there, and, and we went through it, and they were, they were lit up by it. And mm. in the book, you guys teach this tool, but you also talk about how there's a flip side to the demoralizing stuff, which is how we can live in a fantasy of anticipation about how great things are going to be down, in the, down the road and how this, this lover is going to be it or this opportunity is going to be it or whatever. And that, that's another form of living in a place that diminishes us. And so I'm, I'm curious, Barry, what's, what's going on there? Why is it? Because a lot of times we feel greater life force when we're in that place of anticipation and we're looking at the vision board and this is what life's going to be like and it's going to be perfect and all that kind of stuff. So why is it hurting us to live in a state where we're really excited and expecting something awesome to happen in the future? That's what we call false hope or a false promise. And it's, it's a glittery promise that basically tells you if it happens or when it happens, you're exonerated from the laws of the universe. And, you know, the laws are um, thing, there's uncertainty, there's pain, and there's the need for endless work and effort. So everybody wants to get on the gravy train and figure out a way, like a, a vision of success, where they're exonerated from those laws. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's impossible. Another way to say it is we look to the outside world to regulate how we feel inside. So, you know, the classic thing is in high school, if a girl smiled at me, I was walking on air for 24 hours. <laughs> if the next day she ignored me, I was filled with self-loathing. Now, the day I was walking on air, I seemed like I had a lot of life force. But really, I just had a false hope that she was going to come into my life and rescue me from ever having to deal with any dark feelings again. And those false hopes continue into adulthood. If a project doesn't succeed, if your marriage is having trouble, if your kid doesn't get into the right school, we fall into a funk. What we don't realize is that we're looking to these things to exonerate us from regulating our own mood swings. And everybody have, has mood swings. I don't mean that in a clinical sense. I just mean everybody has up days and down days. And none of these things will rescue you from that. Our philosophy is you're responsible for maintaining a positive, hopeful attitude no matter what happens to you. We don't expect you not to feel disappointed when something bad happens. But what we want you to do is learn to be resilient. You know, Confucius had this famous saying where he said, our greatest glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So the, what the mother tool does is it, is it allows you an inner resource, an inner source of resiliency so that you can pick yourself up and dust yourself off and keep moving when you face a disappointment and so that you be more realistic about a relationship, a project, a success, so that you don't get depressed when it doesn't turn out to exonerate you from regulating your own mood or having a bad day or whatever it is, because that's part of life. Right. So instead of hanging on to this idea and using that, like I'm in a bad mood, so I'm going to create this false hope so that I'm in an up mood or I'm going to seek that kind of thing that, you know, I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket and that's going to get me out of my funk. And that becomes my way of coping in the world. Um, I, I can learn how to be resilient. I can learn how to manage my mood, like you said, without these false hopes. And I'm getting there's a, a bit more of a smoother ride there instead of this constant flux of up and down, up and down. Exactly. Whatever goes up must come down. If you're putting your false hopes in a woman, a project, your kid getting into a good college or whatever it is, you're going to go up 
as it looks like it's going to happen. And then you're going to crash when it doesn't happen. And frankly, you're going to crash even if it does happen, because it's not going to turn out to be as magical as you thought it was going to be. My whole life, I wanted to get into Harvard College, you know, because I grew up in the Kennedy era and they went to Harvard and I wanted to go to Harvard. And I got in and you know what? I got incredibly depressed my freshman year because I realized this is just a shitload of work. That's all it is. (laughs) (laughs) There's nothing magical about this. Well, I think there's another layer of this, which is... Um, you guys work with a lot of the people that have uh, to the outside world looks like they got it. They, they got yes. the magic key. And uh, so Phil, I mean, I know you can't, you guys can't name names. It wouldn't be right to do so, but I mean, you have seen amazing things and you've gotten to see that they come down or it's not quite what it appears to be. Is that right? Yeah, it is. A thousand percent. We treat guys who are so rich that, you know what they get depressed about? The other billionaire has a bigger yacht than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but that they actually get depressed about that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, it's kind of a double edged sword. In other words, they they want the magic, but they they tend to come to us because on some level they know it's not healthy, and you know they're never going to accomplish it anyway. So, and because neither of us are that impressed with them, um, we we it's, we attack their ego just like we do anybody else's. That's re- that's really uh, it's it's one of these paradoxes. I had a friend of mine that, 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 that would take people over to India and lead them on these trips. He'd take away their passport and their money, and, and it was designed to help them kind of have this ego death. And the mm-hmm. guy, one of his clients that was uber rich or whatever, just had a meltdown because he couldn't fly on his plane. He had to fly in a, in a commercial flight over to India, and that, that broke him. That was it. Oh, that I was enough. That. <laughs> I love that. That's a great story. Well, we have this thing called the, uh, the loser circle. And the winning circle is competitive, you know, it's comparative. So, you know, you, you imagine, everybody imagines this group of people that aren't subject to normal limitations and life is completely euphoric every moment, etc. Now, the people, we, <laughs> at the age we're at now, we treat the people basically that run L.A. and entertainment-wise, they run the whole country. Um, but almost all of them will come in, you know, and they'll say, well, I've heard about this in crowd and I think I know people in it, but I can't find it. I can't find my way into it. I won two Academy Awards and I have three houses and I have a wife and two girlfriends on the side, you know, whatever it is. But I don't feel like I'm in this, this uh, in winner's circle. I, don't, I feel like a loser. And there's a very simple explanation for that, which is there is no winner's circle. There is nobody in there. Everybody sooner or later meets the limitations that are inherent in in living. So the the trick, and by the way, the the winner's circle is a killer because you think you have to achieve a certain amount, whether it's relative to somebody you're competing with or relative to your age is a big thing, like, at this point in life, I should be further ahead or I should be this or that, whatever. So what it does is it puts you under this tremendous pressure to keep up with the Joneses. And because the whole thing is an, it's an impossible undertaking, deep down it makes you feel like a loser, um, which could be good if you understand. Because our definition of the we call the loser circle is, is not what you think. It's not a bunch of... Uh, screw-ups and ne'er-do-wells. It's just every human being is is in that loser circle. And when you get there and you know you're never going to get in the winner's circle, there's a certain relaxation that takes place. And sometimes the people that really work this hard, they discover what it is they really want to do in life and what's really meaningful for them, independent of some abstract um, you know, winner's circle that doesn't exist anyway. And the the more um, I I study this and watch it, my patients, the, the more I feel like it's one of the key things to happiness and, and also to self-expression. So we're going to soon make uh, T-shirts that say, the, I'm, I'm in the loser circle. <laughs> Sign me Harry up for a few. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. I could talk to you guys all day. I'm, I'm, I'm just feeling a huge sense of gratitude that you guys are doing this work. It's rare. There's so many books that are trying to tell us how to be better at chasing a lot of the things that you're, you guys are telling us that are, are making us weak. 
And I, I just appreciate that you guys have the guts and the wisdom to to give us the tools to to work with it and not be better at chasing these this kind of hungry ghost stuff. So um, just honored that you guys would take the time to talk today. Uh, go get the book, guys. Uh, this is Barry Michaels and Phil Stutz. The book is called Coming Alive, Four Tools to Defeat Your Inner Enemy, Ignite Creative Expression, and Unleash Your Soul's Potential. You can learn more by visiting thetoolsbook.com. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, Great. Trip. Thanks really so much. It. If these interviews are helping you, then please visit The New Man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.